Good morning. My name is Jen Hazelton. My husband, Chris, is behind the camera. And we have two of our three daughters with us today. This is our dog, Murphy. I'm Jess, and this is my dog, Willow. I'm Morgan, and this is my dog, Milo. We are so thankful for Christ Church community, and we welcome you. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to worship. My name is Elizabeth McCauley. I am lead pastor at Christ United Methodist Church here in Rochester, Minnesota, and I wish you a happy new year. In the church year, Advent, which begins this Sunday, begins our church year. So, happy new year to you. Uh, we are hoping that you received one of the Advent boxes that we are delivering to homes throughout uh, Rochester and beyond. If you are on our mailing list, you should have one coming, and uh, if you would like one and did not receive a box, please call our church office. We want to make sure that we can all celebrate the power of Advent together. Next week, I want to let you know that we will be joining with Thrive, which is the ministry uh, downstairs of our Child Care and Family Resource Center, which was begun by you because you care to, to walk with parents and, and children. So uh, as we celebrate the power of breaking the cycle of poverty, every day you'll be invited to learn more about this ministry that you made happen. And finally, I ask that you would make a comment in the Facebook page. If you would, let us know where you are, who you are, what you're thinking about on this day. Will you sign in? And then, would you like this and share it with your friends? Because it's amazing how many more people we are able to share the light of hope with when we share. So, welcome to this time of worship. 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9. Every time I think of you, and I think of you often, I thank God for your lives of free and open access to God, given by Jesus. There's no end to what has happened in you. It's beyond speech, beyond knowledge. The evidence of Christ has been clearly verified in your lives. Just think, you don't need a thing, you've got it all. All God's gifts are right in front of you as you wait expectantly for our Master Jesus to arrive on the scene for the finale. And not only that, but God himself is right alongside to keep you steady and on track until things are all wrapped up by Jesus. God, who got you started on this spiritual adventure, shares with us the life of his Son and our Master Jesus. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. Today we light the Advent candle of hope. The light of Jesus shines in all places. We are never alone. God is right alongside us to keep us steady. God will never give up on us. As we light the candle of hope, we proclaim the mystery and power of our faith. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Breathe your hope through our lives. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Our prayer this morning takes us to the landscape of Isaiah. The landscape of Isaiah is mottled, translucent gray and shades of blue, whispering songs of oppression. The landscape of Isaiah is cluttered, disordered, disappointed, regrettable space littered with injustice. It yearns for prayer as we arrive searching. What Isaiah carried, held and beheld, might have been a weight we dare not imagine. Let's hope so, God, let's hope so. What Isaiah witnessed of brokenness and loss, of longing for restoration and restitution and simple satisfactions might have been a burden we dare not imagine. Let's hope so, God, let's hope so. What Isaiah announced and reported, what he promised, what he prophesied, is the infinite hope we hear in the patient silence of a candle's flame. Look, the presence of God abides, and we are healed. Good morning. I'd like to share with you a psalm of lament, Psalm 80, in which the people of God are asking God to help them in their time of trouble. Let us listen for God's words to us today. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. In the presence of Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. But let your hand be upon those of your right hand, the ones whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. And now we enter into a time of offering, a time of giving thanks. It is a time when we have the opportunity to share some of what we have been given so that those who have been fed the bread of tears are offered the bread of life. And so, let us give thanks for this opportunity to share. Thank you for your generosity.
The season of Advent, and surely this particular Advent of 2020, begins with a plea from Scripture. Oh, that you would tear down the heavens, gracious God, and come down. Roughly 600 years before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah speaks to God on behalf of a people who have been chastened. This reading that I'll share this morning from the third writer of Isaiah speaks to a people who know what it is to experience dislocation and the pain of knowing that they have fallen short of God's vision for a world in which the poor and the vulnerable are protected and cared for. The people of Israel are sent into exile. They spend a generation far from all that they know, and they return back to the land that they love. And what this third writer of Isaiah would have the people hear is this. Listen, God is present. God is powerful. And God desires that God's people live intentional mercy and justice, and compassion, and kindness in their personal and in their corporate civic lives. And the God who makes mountains quake is also the God who intimately shapes us each. Like a potter, Isaiah says, we are the work of our God's hand, and God is still shaping us and working on us corporately as a people and individually. So, hear the word from Isaiah 64, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when a fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no eye has perceived, no eye has seen what any God besides you who works for those who wait for you. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you were angry and we sinned, and because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and you have delivered us into the hand of iniquity. Yet, yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord. And do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. Oh, 
that you would come down. We pray this prayer to God daily in this time of pandemic and distanced living. And God is our beloved parent. We are the clay and God is the potter who shapes us. All of creation is the work of God's hand. I have encountered a soul companion in this season of Advent. Brian Doyle is a writer who spent much of his life in Oregon, and his writing stops my breath because he speaks poetically about the vulnerable stuffs of living. As I think about how I want to spend this burrowed in Advent season, this essay that he wrote, about the power of deep and attentive listening has moved me. It is what I seek to do during this Advent. I seek to call upon God. Oh, that God would come down and gentle the sense of desperate worry that is gripping this world. I seek to call upon God, and I deeply, I deeply seek to listen. I seek to listen as I breathe with God in prayer and as I listen to music and as I seek out the light that is hope, I deeply long to allow the potter of my soul to create space in me to listen, to listen like this speaking and telling from Brian Doyle's heart. He says this, among the many things that my father was very good at was this. When you said something to him, anything at all, anything in the range from surpassingly subtle to stunningly stupid, my father would listen carefully and attentively and silently without interrupting without waiting with increasing impatience for you to finish so that he could correct or top or razz you, and he would even wait a few beats after you finished your remarks on the off chance that you had something else you wanted to add. And then my father would ponder what you said, and then, without fail, he would say something encouraging first before he got around to commenting on what it was you said with such breathtaking subtlety or stupidity. And he did this not once, but many thousands of times, not just with me, but also with my sister and brothers and his lovely bride, our mother, and daughters-in-law, and grandchildren, and colleagues, and friends, so that the number of times he listened patiently and attentively and scrupulously, and then politely waited a few beats to give a speaker a chance to dig deeper into or clamber hurriedly out of the hole he had just dug himself, and, they, and then say something gentle and encouraging before tacking finally toward the subject at hand. Surely it was a million or more times, especially given the fact that he and our mother had many children together, and we are Irish-American Catholics, which is to say people soaked in three talkative cultures, each one entranced by story and legend and myth and the tallest of tales. I well remember some of my own remarkably ill-considered remarks to him as a surly teenager, as a headlong young man, and as a formerly cocky middle-aged man, and in every one of those cases, he was wonderfully consistent in his patience, his calm, his gentleness, his genuine absorption in what I was saying, even though what I was saying was sometimes the most arrogant, glib, foolish nonsense and frippery. I would conclude my burble and babble and watch him lean back 
to consider what I had said, and then after a moment, he would say something quietly encouraging. And then often he would say several more encouraging things. And then he would say, finally, gently comment on what it was I had said, but never with the slightest sneer or slice. Though much of what I said surely deserved to be dismissed out of hand. There was a pace and a rhythm to his listening. And it seems to me such that the listening was far more important than anything else. In so many people, the answering, the opinionating, the jockeying, the topping, the shouting of self, the obviation of the other is the prime work in conversation. But this was not so for my dad, the best listener I have ever known. His listening is now largely a thing of the past. He and his ears have achieved a great and venerable age. And his hearing is a shadow of what it once was. His mind is as sharp or even more so now than ever it was. His generosity and grace remain oceanic. And you could search whole galaxies to no avail for a gentler, wittier man. But this morning, I find that I very much miss that one little thing he did so well that was not little. The way he stared at your face as you spoke, with all of his soul open and alert for your story and how he would wait a few beats when you were done in case there was a coda coming. And then he would lean back and consider what you had just said and then finally lean forward again and say something gentle and encouraging that he would often add something wise and piercing is true. But that is not what I want to leave you with. I want to celebrate his listening, for it is now nearly gone from this world, and it was a rare and extraordinary and unforgettable thing, as you see. Those words from the heart of Brian Doyle. Those words we weave into the intent of the prophet Isaiah for us to know that we are clay in the potter's hands. We are clay in the hands of a potter who listens to us even as the potter shapes us. In the way of Brian Doyle's father, God stares at our faces as we speak with all God's soul open and alert for our story. And God leans toward to say something gentle and encouraging to us if we would but allow the space for deep listening to occur. O oh God, that you would come down. O oh God, shape us in such a way that we create spaces in our lives and in our souls to deeply listen to you, to ourselves, and to each other. As we light candles, As we mark this pandemic advent, as we lean into the power of your vision for your beloved world, open us. Open us, we pray. Amen.
As a people of our potter God, we create spaces in our souls and in our lives in which the light of hope is called to shine and warm and bless and lead. So as you mark this season of Advent, this first Sunday of Advent, this time when we are called to pause and ready ourselves, may you feel God's holy presence, God's heart print upon your very life's clay. May God bless and keep you. Go in peace. Amen.